difficult to detect. Those types of social engineering attacks represent almost all of the email breaches that we see today. And this is from the latest Verizon data breach investigation report. So what does that mean? How do we protect against those types of attacks? And we can do next slide. It used to be rather simple. We used to be able to just put an email security gateway appliance in front of our email server, and that would filter out all the bad email. It could detect spam, malware, and eventually we would add advanced threat protection and sandboxing technology to be able to sort out the zero day targeted attacks. So as the hackers attacks got more and more advanced, we built more advanced technology to thwart their efforts. What are we, what are we, what we are seeing today is that email attacks are built differently and they go right through security gateway. Now, I'm not saying that email security gateways aren't important, but they just aren't working as well as they used to. Even the best email security gateway isn't designed to prevent the types of social engineering attacks that we see today. They weren't designed to detect words. And that's really all social engineering attacks are. So we see these types of attacks land directly in our inboxes, in our users' inboxes. Things like brand impersonation, those pesky Office 365 credential reset emails that are ever so popular. They look super legitimate. They look like they're coming directly from Office 365. We click the link to reset our credentials, type in our credentials, press enter, and then the page stops loading. So what happened was that was a spoofed page. Now we have entered our credentials onto a spoofed login page and the hackers now have our login credentials. This happens all the time. One of the most common forms of spear phishing, we see things like business email compromise. When somebody gains access to a business email account and then pretends to, see, to be someone from outside the organization. So now all of a sudden my CEO is asking me to wire money and that doesn't usually happen. But I'm freaking out because it's my CEO, so I'll do it. And these are really successful, in fact. A lot of distracted emailing is causing a lot of issues today. You know, we're always checking our email super early in the morning, whether we are in line at Starbucks or the airport or whatever it is, we're checking our email when we're also doing a couple of other things, which means we're probably going to make mistakes where maybe normally we wouldn't if we were paying closer attention. Purchase credentials are an issue for us today. So my login credentials are for sale, and so are yours. I don't mean to alarm you, but we hear about data breaches all the time from companies that we use, companies that we've trusted in the past. When hackers gain that information, and it just so happens that a lot of us use the same login credentials for one account that we will for another, it's just what we do. It's so hard to keep track of so many passwords these days, so we reuse the same passwords, which means when hackers breach one account that I have used, they have access to those login credentials, so they probably have login credentials for other accounts of mine as well. And just to wrap this up, I'll move quickly through the personal accounts that are accessible through iOS. Hackers can access our personal account and then they can gain access to our corporate accounts because of our universal inboxes. Conversation hijacking, super difficult to detect. This is where hackers are insert, inserting themselves into legitimate conversation threads. And finally, account takeover. A big problem that we hear about is once a hacker gains access to your account, be it a BC attack, a brand impersonation attack, maybe they just purchase your credentials you can't stop them from logging in. And now they're in. They can spread laterally and cause a lot of damage from the inside. It's really difficult to detect, right? So what do we do? 
What we see is that people are going to influence security more than technology of policy. What I'm saying here today is that at the end of the day, we can put as many technical controls over our email as we want. But inevitably, a social engineering attack will land in our user's inbox, and it's up to the user to determine whether or not that social engineering spear phishing attack is going to be successful. It's up to me to interact with it or report it. What we know is that security awareness training addresses the human element. So I have gotten my email security gateway for my inboxes. I have artificial intelligence that is connected to Microsoft's API. That will definitely help having some technical controls around my inboxes. But when it comes to the user, we want to be able to wrap safety around them as well. And we do that in the form of security awareness training. Next slide, thanks. So I don't want to say an emerging market, but it's becoming more and more popular. It's becoming less of a nice to have and more of a critical component of any organization email protection posture. And this isn't just me saying that, but this is what is being reflected in the market. So security awareness training has undergone a lot of growth in the past three years. Once valued at $354 million in 2016, the security awareness training program has grown to almost 660 million by the end of 2019 and by even more so by the end of 2021. Gartner predicts that this market will be valued at $1.5 billion, almost double within just a couple of years. So again, the market is growing quickly because of organizations are understanding why it's so important. Next slide. So security awareness training, what does that look like? Well, there are three different components to any good security awareness training program. You have simulation. So you want to make sure to adopt a solution that is going to allow you to test simulations in multiple vectors. It's not just about email. Though the majority of spear phishing attacks come through email, not all of them do. And as our users are becoming more adept in being able to identify suspicious emails, hackers are spreading out and learning to use different channels to launch spear phishing attacks. We'll talk more about that in a bit. You want to leverage a solution that has an extensive library of training content that can cater to different learning styles within your organization. Everybody's showing up to the party with a different level of expertise. So we want to be able to cater to everyone. And then finally, you want to find a solution that's going to allow you to run detailed reporting metrics that will be able to determine the effectiveness of our testing and training efforts. So you'll be able to perform the next round of testing and training within your organization and allow your users to continue to get better and better at identifying suspicious attacks. So my point here is it doesn't have to be in this order. It doesn't have to go simulation and training and analysis. It can go in any order that you want and you can mix it up all the time. My point here is that this is a continual process. You can't just arrive at secure. It's not a destination. I want to add another reason why we are seeing such a rapid growth in this market segment. It has to do with the idea that we have the core components of a program. Everyone kind of agrees that there are three basic stages, which we are outlined here. Next slide. But what we are also seeing is that there are comp compliance requirements now. You may have the government compliance, you may have industry associated compliance. There are requirements. They are even just, these are even just frameworks that you don't have to follow, but it's the best practice that you do. Just recently, as an example in Texas, there was a house bill that was passed that now requires state local government employees that have to complete a certified cybersecurity training annually. 
A little bit further back, historically speaking, the national government enacted legislation that requires government agencies to be compliant with certain security awareness training platforms. You may also have situations where you might be undergoing SOC 2 compliance, or you're looking at iOS 2700, or maybe even like HIPAA or Cybertrust and PCI and GDPR and others. They all touch on things that are required and security awareness training is now one of those requirements. They're getting into what you need to do. What they don't yet touch on is how you need to do it. But then before we even get into the how you need to do it, which are the tips we are going to provide in later slides, I'm kind of curious who should be doing it. Next slide. So the first problem that we have is that social engineering training and security awareness training is that it is a new skill set. It's a new area of expertise. So that takes us to tip number one. Next slide. Let's think about the components that are at play. In order to effectively run a security awareness training program, I encourage you to think about this from the perspective of three different lenses. Think about business, technology, and social. Your awareness program is at the intersection of all three areas. So for example, business people would think about the processes in place. They'll think about risks, they like to set up the strategy and the goals for the organization. The individuals in the technology roles, they like to think about where information systems are, what the information systems have, and what technologies are in place to protect people in the organization. From a social, social perspective, we're interested in cultural norms biases, the way people interact among the inner organization business units, and the idea that when you put it in an awareness training program to trick people, your goal is to train people. And that's the key here, that all of these skills are required and you need an individual in a role, and they could be any role. They could be in technology, HR, but they need to be well versed in understanding the way that these three areas influence and the awareness program. With this in mind, how about we look at tip number two? Tip number two today is mind your vector. So I alluded to this a little before, though we do see the majority of spear phishing and social engineering attacks come through email is not the only vehicle for attacks to get in. Hackers are utilizing different vectors. Smishing is becoming more and more popular. This is a sort of hybrid word of SMS phishing. So attacks that come through via text message, and these can be super tricky because we aren't able to see a lot of the clues that we are trained to look for. Who's the sender? Oh, I don't know. It's just that six digit number, right? Hover over the link. Oh, I can't because it's a text message. We're seeing more and more of these attacks come through as our users are getting better at detecting them in email. We're also seeing a rise in phishing attacks. This is voice phishing, another hybrid word. I personally get a ton of robo calls a day. And sometimes I'll answer them because they're kind of funny saying stuff like my social security number has been compromised or I owe the IRS a bunch of money. They're coming to get me and I need to call this number or stay on the line. As it speaks to some of the social norms that we have, it pulls on our fear a little bit. Sometimes they target more elderly people. My, my grandmother gets these calls and it makes her really nervous. Like, who's calling me? So these are becoming more and more popular and we want to train users how to respond to a phishing attack. And they are not always these super outrageous ones. Sometimes they're really simple and we'll look at an example of that in a second here. We also want to look at physical media. Some people might think, well, what are you talking about? Physical media attacks? That's not realistic. 
But we were actually talking the other day about a realistic story that we encountered. Hackers go, can go online and know what we're doing via LinkedIn, Facebook, or any other social media account. So let's say a hacker was on and saw that I visited a conference recently. Saw on my LinkedIn that, uh, that I was at a tech conference and decided to send me a USB drive in the mail saying, hey, it was great to meet you at the conference. Here's the follow-up. Sorry, we ran out of these, but here is the information I promised you. Right? Super sneaky. If I didn't know, if I wasn't trained, I may put that USB drive in my computer. Maybe it contains malware. These kinds of things happen. So we want to be able to train our users to properly respond in that situation rather than react without thinking. So here's an example of something that came up recently where Office 365 users were targeted by a voicemail scam. So the attack began with an email informing the re recipient that they missed a phone call and gave them a link saying, hey, log into your account and listen to this voicemail. So this starts as an email phishing attack and has a link to a phishing site in it. What it does differently is when the user clicks on that phishing site and enters their credentials, it takes them to the second page that looks like it's loading a page that says, hey, we're going to load that voicemail. While it is retrieving that voicemail, it starts to play an audio file, almost like a preview. And the voicemail audio file sounds super legitimate. So hackers are making really extravagant efforts to incorporate different modalities and making those attacks more realistic. So something to be very aware of, we want to be sure to not just know how to spot email phishing attacks, but also when they arrive via text, via voice, and even via physical media. So let's move on to tip three. When launching security awareness training programs, you want to define your workflow. You want to map out, map this out. Anybody can just launch out spear phishing simulations and training videos, but is that really successfully working to mitigate risks in your user population? Probably not. So you really want to define your workflow and it can be simple. This is just an example. Every organization is going to be different, but you want to start with a baseline. You want to start with a relatively easy simulation to see how your users respond. Who clicks on it? Who reports it? Is the majority of your organization savvy enough to identify something really simple? And it's not just about savviness. Who takes their time? Because you could know that maybe you're in a hurry. So let's baseline everyone to see where they are. Then we analyze the results of that and launch the first targeted training efforts. You'll then adjust the next simulation to retest, then reanalyze, and the cycle repeats. So the analysis portion is really the crux of this. That's where the process starts, and that's where the cycle begins. So tip number four is identifying risky user groups. Now this one is really important to do because you want to think about who is likely to get a phishing email. Typically, it's the executive teams, those in human resources and those in accounting. These three groups of users are at an increased risk and likelihood of receiving phishing emails. And we'll talk about executives. Why executives? Well, executives, their job is to be in the public, representing an organization. They are out in the public, maybe looking for investments, or maybe they're communicating in press releases or sharing their ideas, or maybe even being instructors at a local university. The idea is that they're out in the public. Therefore, it is easy for hackers to find these people. Once they find these people, what do they want to do with it? 
This is the tipping point, if you will, of the executive. The executive commands attention within the organization. They are individuals that can utilize laterally asking someone to do something and guarantee that that will happen. It makes it really interesting for hackers and important that they can find and when they can do business email compromise if they can get and pretend to be an executive or maybe it's account takeover like the slide earlier when we talked about where a few of those phishing techniques target executives trying to impersonate them trying them trying to make them to get do an action like clicking a link or wiring funds doing some sort of transaction human resources that's another group their job is by default is to open attachments that contain resumes so you need to make sure that your individual in human resources they know how to deal with atta attachments in a secure way they know how to detect a phishing email so the attachment that comes in isn't a potentially malicious one and that's where it gets the hacker's attention because human resources they process very sensitive information employment docs insurance tax related type of information medical benefits etc now a third group is accounting or a financial related individual which isn't surprising we have heard about this before you may even know people that have personally dealt with a bank related transaction but from a business perspective accounting and finance deals with invoices and payrolls direct director uh, deposits wire transfers the movement of money they're typically going to see the emails hey please forward these funds to such and such a vendor for payment or they're going to see an accounts payable notification now there is one more class of individual that i want you to think about and it's actually everybody but it's everybody with the caveat of those who publish information in the public forum or on the internet. And I want you to think about this group. And it requires a little bit of research on your end, but those employees who are more inclined to use social media, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Pinterest, all of those, those individuals who have involvement in community volunteer organizations, or those individuals that participate in youth, youth sports or part of a school or some sort of religious function. The idea is that you can find information about people online. Can that information be used to target your individuals and simulate a spear phishing attack? Now, I want to give you a little story about this one as we take all of these pieces together. Before I came to Barracuda, I was a pen tester and my responsibility was to simulate the attacks that hackers would perform and answering the question that what happens if me, an organization, is targeted by a hacker? One of the fundamental stages that all hackers perform, and thus as a pen tester, I needed to perform something called open source intelligence. I needed to do recon on my organization. I went out and looked at individuals and community involvement. And I found one who posted on Facebook that she had recently bought a home. So I went back and worked through LinkedIn to discover this individual was a vice president at a bank in the Midwest. So now I knew their role in my target and I knew a little bit about their personal life. I then used some more information that I collected and I sent them three spear phishing emails. The first one, was a fake Pinterest posting board of a new home renovation project. The second email was a moving services email, helping them get ready to move and get ready to move into their new home. This third email was one related to real estate transactions. And the idea was that I was able to simulate three different ways that they could be targeted based on information they published on the internet. So I encourage you to think, to take a look at it from that perspective as well. So we thought about risky groups. Let's talk about realism. Tip number five, realistic simulations that vary in difficulty. We first need to understand where difficulty comes from and that comes out of the core component in email. 
the subject line, the recipient, the use of emotional triggers, such as a sense of, a sense of urgency or something like limited time offer, the link to the phishing site, and then the realistic signature that's included. Each of these individual components are related to the standard phishing email. But furthermore, the complexity that's built into the email is the manipulation of the greeting and the content and the grammar and the use of maybe a publicly recognized brand or logo. All of these put together drive complexity. So on the next slide, we're going to see real email threats that are a great way to test your employees. Is your organization using Office 365? Does your organization have a relationship with Microsoft? Those are two really commonly impersonated brands and services, and this is one great way to use realism to test. How would your employees respond to a fake email that uses a service that we employ at our organization? I encourage you to, at the end of this call, or later in the week, to go out to Google and type in a brand impersonation phishing email. You're going to see over 400,000 results that talk about brand impersonation attacks. I'll keep it short, but at the top of that list will be Microsoft, Netflix, PayPal, Bank of America, Chase, DocuSign, and Facebook. I encourage you to work these into your testing and to make sure that your employees understand and know how to handle fake versions of a real service. And just to add on to it, that, if you have any visibility into the emails that you're already getting your users to click or have caused problems in the past, if you're able to discover that retroactively via maybe an infinite response solution, you can use those emails too. Using those emails as a template to further expose your users to them is a really great idea. So that's where threat intelligence really comes into play. So let's think about another way to look at difficulty and the idea of not just simulating realism, but as you work your way through a program, it's important to know where you're starting. We saw in that previous slide with the workflow that you have to start with the baseline. You kind of have to get a sense to where you are in a program. Is your organizational click rate somewhere in that seven to 12%? Some things that we are seeing, in fact, due to a lot of industry research is that the average phishing email sent to organizations worldwide is somewhere in the neighborhood of seven to 12% as a click rate. So any given email sent to any given organization is likely to get seven to 12% of the recipients to click a link. So that's average, that's intermediate. Emails with lower click rates, they are easier to detect, they are more basic, that's less than 7%. Now emails that are more difficult to detect and have a higher click rate, and that's above 12%. So you can see, Take this idea, and as you work through your testing, you can kind of ratchet up the difficulty level. So start out easy. Use some of those simulation components I mentioned, you know, the signature, the, con the content, the logos, and add in complexity and work your way through a program. Understand how your employees react to and deal with emails that have higher difficulty levels. And as you can actually use the progression to demonstrate the effectiveness of your training program is paying off. You know, we've talked about the idea a lot that it is a test, train, analyze and repeat. So you do your test, maybe you're at the basic level. You then train your employees to look for clues in that basic email and look at your results. And then maybe you move up to intermediate and you repeat the cycle. You can now go back to your bosses and to management and say, hey, look, our investment in this training program is lowering our click rate by this percent based on this level, and it allows you to demonstrate progression. So with that idea in mind, let's look at a simple program. Here is an example of what it might look like to roll out a testing program 
meaning a collection of different campaigns assembled in some sort of strategic way. So the idea here is to start out at a baseline in round one, figure out how well your organization deals with an intermediate level of difficulty email. The odds are good if you don't or haven't done a lot of training and a lot of testing, that your click rate will be somewhere north of 8% which that means it is time for you in round two to go back down and take it a little easier and go into the basic difficulty level. So in round one, start out with that seven to 12% at intermediate level. Do round one, then do some training, then go into round two. Here are five different email ideas to choose from. So choose one out of round one and then one out for round two and then simulate your email you're likely to see is that you've done a test, you've done your training, and now in round two, your click rate is actually relatively low, which is good. You want to see that your users are now practicing good detection techniques. Now, they're looking for emails, they are more aware, which means now in round three, of course, after you do your training in round two, to make it just a little bit more difficult. What you should see in round three is that you're getting back to that intermediate threshold. So you started out in the intermediate, you bounce down to basic, and round three is intermediate again, but you're ratcheting up the difficulty in a very systematic way. You're able to say to management, look, hey, our program is demonstrating improvement. We're being strategic in the way that we are testing and training our employees. Round three, pick a test do some training, and of course now go to round four. In round four, you can see it gets interesting. Round four is the litmus test of your program. Are you ready to make things more difficult? You know, I mentioned earlier the idea of leveraging open source intelligence and doing spear phishing on employees. If you were to do spear phishing right out of the gate on your first test, you're going to have a super high click rate and you won't know where to go because you're leveraging so many of the different components and making things so difficult. In my experience, it is important to start basic and add difficulty. It's so much harder to start at difficult and work your way back down to basic and then back up. But in round four, as you can see, you're really taking it to your employees. You're really testing them. You're stretching their mental awareness and they really paying attention. Are they remembering all the things that you train them on? And the results of round four are going to help you understand, do you repeat this program that's outlined here on the slide, or do you step it up and go intermediate and then hard and harder and keep on going? So in round four, you're looking at the idea of that litmus test. You're looking to see what happened. So what other things could you look at besides the click rates and know what you need to talk about in any of the rounds? Click rate is just one metric. It gives you some insight, but it doesn't tell you the whole picture. Remember earlier when we were talking about the idea that the intelligence or the awareness program is comprised of three different lenses and one of those lenses was business. People in the business roles are concerned about risk and strategy and setting goals. Well, when you look at stuff beyond the click rate, you can help determine the riskiness of a user. Users that have the clicking bug, they'll click on anything you put in front of them. Anyone that gets an email and clicks, that's a risky user. That's a group of users you definitely need to train more often and test more often. How many people actually respond to the email? In my pen test, I love getting responses because that person was the one to target for all my future testing. They were fooled in such a way that they were willing to interact with me, uh, pretending to be a malicious hacker. And they were really someone I focused on. Hackers are the same way. They love responses, I can assure you. How many people entered their login forum? Was the login forum on an insecure site? The idea here is that 
second and third point interaction. You're looking at interaction rates. Does someone show a willingness to do something when receiving an email? That means they are truly fooled by your test. Alternatively, look at it from another perspective. How many individuals are reporting the emails? Which individuals are reporting? From a different perspective, those individuals that report your email, that's a really good group to assemble together because those people demonstrate that they know how to detect and handle phishing emails. They understand the business processes but put in place for dealing with phishing emails. They understand what technical controls are available to them to take a look at and protect themselves from phishing emails. And then they understand the social influencing clues that are in there. Those people are good to help promote your training program. In fact, I have seen the effectiveness of a training program greatly enhanced by not having it come down through the chain of command from the boss and the managers to the employees, but having it grow laterally across the organization. Have the group that are good at spotting phishing emails lead your training initiatives. They are the co-workers of your employees, the collaborators, and they are probably more likely to be the friend. Therefore, it makes the message much more receptive. And to the last point, how many people open attachments? Again, this is a little bit more situational. Back to the first three points, the idea here is that if someone is willing to open an attachment, look at it from two different perspectives. One is that they opened it, so you need to train them on that. But two, it gives you the ability to test your technical controls. Did the antivirus on your computer block it? Did the email gateway block it because it had an attachment? So it gives you another way to look at and pull all the pieces of your total email protection system, or all that matters to keep your employees safe and your organization safe, pulling it all together. So to recap, top tips from an effective security awareness training program. Understand the components at play. Approach this thinking about business technology and the social elements of security awareness. Mind your vectors. It's not just about email. It's about voice phishing and text phishing as well. Define your workflow. So write out a plan. Make sure you're taking a pro programmatic approach to security awareness training. Four is identifying your risky user groups. It's not always the executives. It's not always the people holding the cash. It could be the people that are most actively involved in their community. Number five, use realistic simulations that vary in difficulty. So again, going back to that programmatic approach, ratchet up the difficulty, take it back down a notch. Make sure your users are progressing as they get introduced to new attacks by your simulations. And finally, look at it more than just a click rate. There are other elements to take into awareness when we are talking about security awareness. At the end of the day, we really just want our users to behave with security at the front of their minds all the time, not just when they're clicking or not clicking emails. I want to talk to you folks now about Barracuda Managed Fish Line because that is Barracuda's fully managed end user security awareness training solution. So let's bring it in and I'll tell you a little bit about it. For organizations of all sizes, Fish Line teaches end users to identify and report spear phishing attacks, whether it's email, text, voice, or even physical media attacks. Our security end user awareness training and phishing simulation services helps you discover your customer's vulnerabilities. Many regulations such as HIPAA, FINRA, and PCI DSS require businesses to provide security awareness training to their employees. And this service will make it easy for you to help your customers meet those requirements. We provide robust reporting from the various drip campaigns that help you identify the risk level within your customer's organization. 
The best part is we manage everything for you. Manage Fishline is available to your customers without additional work for you or your technicians. Our dedicated team will set up and send out the security campaigns every month directly to your end users and send you regular labeled, white labeled reports to share with your customers. To get started, all you have to do is configure the necessary whitelisting and provide a list of email addresses you'd like to include in the security awareness training campaigns. Security awareness training is only a part of your total email protection posture. So we still need a gateway protection. Spam and malware, advanced threats aren't going to, advanced threats aren't going anywhere. So we use Barracuda Essentials for protection against known threats. Essentials also provides a layer of resiliency, backup email continuity for potential outages or accidental deletion. But then we want to look at the inbox itself. A lot of those threats today, they are bypassing the gateway or rather going through the gateway. And for the attacks that contain no malicious payload, we leverage Barracuda Sentinel, which actually sits within the inbox to detect patterns of communication within your organization and can alert you of any anomalies in those communication patterns. So like, how my CEO doesn't usually email me more or less on a Sunday asking for money. So Barracuda Sentinel says, hey, this doesn't look right, and we'll pull it out of your user's inbox for you to review. And then again, no email protection solution is complete without a security awareness training program. We don't want to layer and put in so much effort into all these technical controls for one mistake from a user to turn the whole thing down and transfer wire funds for $100,000. Because one user's interaction from an uneducated or unaware user can topple everything, not just monetarily, but can do significant brand damage. And the inverse of that is true as well. One educated user can save or prevent that from happening. So it's extremely important that we also look at the users and enable them as another layer of security. And then finally, we wrap this all up with forensics and incident response. This helps to automate incident response and accelerate the response you get when users report those emails. So you can clean up quickly after anything goes wrong. This is the Barracuda Total Email Protection Approach. So if you have any questions, please go ahead and type them in the question panel and we'll answer them later. So, Next slide. So what's next? Assess your ex existing security awareness training program. Are you, are you just checking the boxes? Are you regulated by compliance so you just have a security awareness training program and you fire off emails once a quarter to meet those compliance requirements? Is that what you're doing? Or are you really working to actively mitigate risks amongst your user population? See how Fishline can help improve your overall security. We're happy to hook you up with a trial, provide more information about Fishline, and I also invite you to take a look at your email security posture today. Are there any gaps that you're missing? Right, if we go back to the stack, uh, is there something that's missing? How can we help? Thank you for taking the time to listen today. And if you did ask any questions, we'll be getting back to you in the next 24 hours to answer those. Thanks, Jane. And we did have one question. Will we get a copy of the presentation and a copy of the recording and presentation will be sent out within 24 hours. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day.